Aloha, this is Professor Porter. We're talking about the federal rules of evidence and in particular hearsay. It's really tough to uh, try to landscape all of hearsay and everywhere that you'll be going in the weeks that you'd be studying it in a typical uh, law school class. But one way to think about it is if you imagine that the, the sort of discussion on behalf of the opponent and the move on behalf of the opponent, the one who stands in opposition and the one who's charged with objecting, um, is really the same. They're, they're making a definitional argument just like they do with other um, other exception, other uh, objections under the rules, right? They're saying we have objection hearsay. That means I have the foundational requirements. I have the elements of an objection under 801C. I'm going to go over to sidebar knowing that I'm going to make an argument that this is out of court statement for the truth of the matter asserted. Everything else and all the other pathways and all the other directions that an evidentiary argument can take really lie with where, which direction the proponent goes. How does the proponent respond to that uh, familiar hearsay objection? So here's one way to, to look at um, uh, the fabric of all that, we can, all that can happen in an evidentiary conversation under hearsay. Uh, again, it's objection hearsay. That's where the proponent's coming from. Everything else is for the responses coming from. So I think of it as three different ways, three different sort of blankets for the uh, proponent's responses. The opponent is always saying the same thing. They're always saying definitional hearsay under 801. Objection hearsay, that means this is a statement out of court for truth of the matter asserted. The first response can always be, you say that, I say you don't have it. You say you have the one, two, three foundational requirements. I say you don't have the one, two, three. Maybe it's not a statement. Maybe it's not out of court. Or most popularly, maybe it's not offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Do you make an argument on this furthest left uh, box, you make an argument that the definition is not met. You, opponent, do not have your foundational requirements. You can't meet the 123 uh, elements under 801C. So therefore, my response is you don't have it. So the court should overrule the objection and allow in the testimony, allow in the evidence. That's my first place. Second place is I, I can go to some exemptions. That is some, some instances, one Subpart later, 801D, some instances where the rules say, no, these are the foundational requirements for when something is defined as not hearsay. So maybe you say as the opponent objection hearsay and you have 801C, your one, two, three foundational requirements. As the proponent, I can say, well, I have foundational requirements of my own that this is not hearsay defined. And if it meets not hearsay defined, it's either meets a, it's a statement, uh, like a prior inconsistent statement, a prior consistent statement, an out-of-court identification, or statements offered against party opponents. Um, if I meet those foundational requirements for establishing something that's not hearsay defined under 801D, then I'm going to also win that objection. The objection, the hearsay objection is going to be overruled, and I'm going to be allowed to get into that evidence, and again, for the truth of the matter asserted. And lastly, and, and really it should proceed this way as a checklist for anyone going through and analyzing a hearsay problem, lastly would be, yes, this may be hearsay, but an exception applies also for the proponent. The proponent can go to a whole host of 803 reliability exceptions. These are narrow instances where we say the circumstances of this statement are reliable enough, therefore we're going to allow the statement in without an opportunity to meet the declarant, without an opportunity to cross-examine the declarant. The uh, 804 necessity exceptions, they have to do with unavailability of the declarant, so we wouldn't be able to get at the statement any other way. Also narrow exceptions, and then 807 is a residual exception with its own foundational requirements. So three different pathways that the proponent can take. I can argue against uh, essentially the foundational requirements of the objection under 80C. I can argue my own foundational requirements under 80D that it's not hearsay defined, or I can argue um, these narrow circumstances of exceptions. Sure, it might be hearsay as you suggest, opponent, but an exception applies, and those exceptions too are going to have foundational requirements. So imagine if you're the opponent, uh, you're starting out with always the same familiar routine, throwing your flag in the middle of the ring, objection, hearsay. This means I have the one, two, three. It's a statement, it's out of court, and it's offered for that bad purpose under the rule, the truth of the matter asserted. Depending on where the proponent goes from there, I might have to pivot. If the proponent says, okay, you say 801D, 801C, 
but I say 801D that this is a, a statement by a party opponent or a statement attributed to a party under 801D2. Well, the conversation is going to narrow as the opponent, the one that launched the objection in the first place, I'm not going to go back to saying the definitional requirements. I'm going to respond. You say you have your own foundational requirements, Mr. Proponent. You say you have a statement attributed to a party under 801D2. Well, I say, no, you don't. Nah, -uh. you don't have those foundational requirements and our argument narrows to the place where you chose to go. Same goes for exceptions. If I am the opponent, I stop the proponent from asking their questions at trial because it implicates a statement. I throw my flag that says objection hearsay into the middle of the courtroom. We make our way over to sidebar. I, of course, am sticking with this is an out-of-court statement for the truth of the matter asserted that bad purpose. And this time, the proponent says, well, it might be hearsay, but an exception applies, and we'll have a lot of videos about exceptions. This is an 8032 excited utterance, which has three foundational requirements. I say that I, as the proponent, have met the foundational requirements for this exception to the rule. Well, again, the conversation narrows for the opponent. They're not going to go back to this left box over here and start arguing about the foundational requirements for hearsay. You're going to be saying, no, that exception doesn't apply. You don't have the one, two, three foundational requirements under 8032 for an excited utterance. You're missing out. And if the exception is met, the objection is overruled and the evidence is allowed in. If the objection is not met and, they, and the proponent does not meet the foundational requirements of that exception, then it goes back to the fact that we're talking about hearsay. We're talking about uh, the original objection lodged by the opponent. So that objection would be sustained and the testimony or evidence would be excluded or not allowed. So there's just all these directions against this fabric and most of them belong to the proponent. And the yellow there is what the opponent would say. They're basically just honoring the definition of hearsay and objecting that this testimony uh, violates or this document violates uh, the one, two, three foundational requirements. And then there's all these different places where the proponent, and really what we're talking about is a checklist variety. Is this hearsay? Is this not hearsay? Those are both definitional. Is this hearsay 801C? Is this not hearsay 801D? Or is this hearsay, but does an exception apply? That's the way that I would checklist a hearsay discussion, a hearsay problem. If you have it in your outline, to go in that order. Talk about definitional hearsay first, because it's always the definition that's going to be implicated with the opponent's objection hearsay. Then think about the options for the proponent. The proponent can say, you don't have your definition, you don't have your one, two, three under hearsay, uh, and we can just argue uh, the box in yellow. Or I can say, I have my own foundational requirements under 801D that this is not hearsay defined, and not hearsay defined under 801D trumps your objection under 801C. Or I can say, you have, uh, this may be hearsay, you may have your one, two, three, Mr. Opponent under uh, the definition of hearsay under 801C, but I have some exception, maybe an exception under 803, maybe an exception under 804, maybe a residual exception under 807.